why it's very important to do it in A-B testing, and which are the top common mistakes that people do when doing it. So, a bit about myself, so as you can tell by the name, I'm Italian. I currently live in London and I work for iTech Media as experimentation manager. Feel free to add me on LinkedIn if you want, and we can definitely share some knowledge about conversion rate optimization. So just to give you a bit of context, when it gets to A-B testing, um, basically what we do is we run a test, right? And you've got control and variation. But what we actually do is we collect a small sample size, pretending or actually guessing, statistically speaking, that that's going to be what the entire population, which is the traffic that we're going to get in the following months, will do. So it's very important that when we run A-B tests, we actually stick by the statistical framework because we are guessing and the more accurate is the guess the less money your company or your website is gonna, is gonna waste so the real question here is how big should be the sample size what's the right sample size and there are some common mistakes that sample size calculation can help you to avoid these three common mistakes uh, they're actually way more this is actually the top three I suffered from the first one which is the regression towards the mean, which is not a mistake, but there's a mistake uh, that is linked to this specific phenomenon. So in statistics, when you collect the data, when you're trying to guess the distribution of a sample size of a sample, um, what happens is that you basically, you will see a lot of fluctuation in the initial moment. Let's say that you push a new functionality live, like Instagram did, for instance, with the stories. They made the, the button with a different color, so the uptake is going to be way higher than it is right now, or than if they use the standard color of the button. So you're going to see, especially returning visitors, using a lot of new functionality, and you might say, okay, uh, that, this test is actually a winner, because you're going to see a big increase. But actually, if you wait for a sufficient length of time, or if you have enough samples, you're gonna see that if you, over time, it will just reduce this fluctuation and, will, and it will basically uh, go towards a mean. So calculating the right sample size in the beginning before you actually start the test is gonna help you to avoid being mistaken by the initial fluctuation of people updating too much your functionality or your new uh, feature on the website. So this is called like novelty effect and it's very common for new visitors, for returning visitors. Another risk is obviously outliers. If you don't collect enough samples, you're going to find always outliers of people behaving in a different way from what your com um, common user base will do. So if you really stick to the right sample size, you're going to definitely avoid uh, the regression towards the mean uh, to actually mistake your sample size. The second mistake, this is more for A-B testing, but sample size calculation can definitely help you to avoid it, is peaking. Like, you probably everyone that does conversion rate optimization has this, let's say, problem. Uh, we launch a test and we can't wait to stop them and tell the business, oh yes, we got a winner, we are really smart guys. Um, what happens is, if you, like when, when we analyze the test, usually most of the companies, or if you use online calculators, they use frequentist framework, which is basically based on an assumption that you need to define before you launch the test what's going to be your sample size. So if you keep peaking, you're basically going against the, your, your, your initial uh, assumption. And this is actually very dangerous from a statistical point of view. Plus, if you don't wait enough time, or if you don't collect enough samples, what's going to happen is that basically you are going to make a decision without having enough evidence. The third one is actually a mistake that very often I've seen in my, my experience, which is people, like myself, launching a test, and then after two weeks say, oh shit, actually, I don't, know, I don't have enough traffic on the page. That's because most of the people, or some people, skip the initial pre-analysis when launching a test. With sample size calculation, that's very easy. You, you calculate how many samples you need to reach statistical significance, and you check your analytics and say, actually, you know what, I can run this test, or I can't. There are some tips that, that, that you can use, like maybe you can run the same test in a bunch of pages, so you can get more traffic and maybe you reach statistical significance. It's always important that before you launch a test, you know exactly how long it's going to take, more or less, to pause it. So, the real deal about this presentation is 
from my experience, I used to use online calculators. And most of them have lacked some information that is vital if you want to be accurate when estimating the sample size. This is three examples, three screenshots that I took from my phone. Uh, the first one is Optimizely. I guess everyone knows Optimizely. It's basically the most famous and actually the most expensive platform for doing a bit testing. You can see a bit testy and unbounds as is the telescreenshot. So if you look at the data they ask you before calculating the sample, you will always find the baseline, conversion rate, so control. And you can find this in all of the three. And then you will find minimal detectable effect, which is basically your prediction on how the test is going to go. This is the minimum difference that you're willing to accept measuring with your test. Obviously, the more you want to be sensitive, so the more you go down, even if you want to measure 1% uplift, you're going to need a lot of data. So if you go bolder with ideas that actually result in big uplifts, you're going to need less samples. But we're going to see that with a bit of formula later. And the third one that optimizely asks you is the statistical significance. Everyone is quite familiar with that. Usually people use 90, 95, 99. If you are big companies, you got a lot of traffic. But what you, what you see from the first one is that it's missing one thing that for me is vital, which is the power of a test. Because when you get a winner, the power tells you how confident you are that pushing this change line, you're going to get the same result. And if you go to a B test, you're going to see, OK, go the statistical significance, go the, the statistical power. But actually, it's missing something else, which is the number of experiences that you're going to test. Because the more variations you have to test, the more likely you are to get false positives. That's because, obviously, it's like it's called spaghetti testing. You stick spaghetti to, you throw spaghetti to the, to the wall, some spaghetti probably are going to stick, and you find the winner. So the more spaghetti you throw, the more likely you are to find the winner, right? And this is something that Google did in first instance. Like, I, I don't remember exactly the number, but they tested like 60,000 shades of blue in the logo. Obviously, you're going to find a winner. That's, that's like mathematical. But the chance of getting a false positive goes up and up and up. So given that I was facing this issue, I said, how is that possible that the samples are required is always the same, no matter how many variations I push live? I did a bit of research, and I came across this rule of thumb. And it's important that we, th we, we think about the, uh, this formula as a rule of thumb, because there's no rule set in stone that will tell you, oh, that's the formula to use for sample size calculation. It's just an estimate. You need to be as much as you can to make it as accurate as you can. And this is, comes from a Stanford University document that I found online, and it's quite interesting. So I will show you later. There is a calculator that I attached. You can download it. You can start using it for your AP test. It's going to be a bit more strict than the online calculators, but accuracy requires more data. So the number k, the, the factor k, it, it's just a factor that depends on the power and the statistical significance that you set. You're going to find in the Excel calculator. We can skip it for now. Then the second parameter is the number of experiences. The more variations you add to the test, the more samples you're going to need. And then if you look at the last part, which is probably the most interesting, the, there are two ingredients here. That's the conversion rate, which is your baseline, and there is the minimum detectable effect. Now, as you can see, the higher is your conversion rate, and the denominator is basically going to be bigger, which means that you need less samples. So this formula tells you how many samples you need per experience. So if you apply this formula, you're going to find, say, 1,000. It means that you need, to, you need, to, you need 1,000 visitors per experience. Now, conversion rate is very important. If you're lucky enough to get a page that has already a very high baseline, you're probably going to require less samples. That's the case of my company. In my previous company, which is actually a very big book, bookmaker, we used to have a very low conversion rate because it's normal. Like you probably get 10%, 15%, 20%. And we used to use a lot of traffic, but we had it. When I joined this new company, the traffic was sensibly lower, and they were running way more tests. So I asked myself, how is that possible? Well, what do they do? And that's because the conversion rate of, that of our, our pages is way higher than 50%. It gets to 70, 65, 60%. So we need less samples to, to, to run the same test. And the other bit is the minimum detectable effect that, as we've seen before, it's in the optimizing calculator, in every calculator online, is the minimum difference that you want to, to get. Now, the bigger it is, as you can see, the denominator is going to get bigger, the less samples you need. So if you don't have enough traffic to run a test, try to go bolder. Try to run 
test that actually are making a big impact on the page. That's going to lower down the number of samples you need. So I can show you an example. That's the QR code. Feel free to scan it. Uh, I will share the link with you if you don't do it. I will show you very quickly how it works because it's very interesting to see the difference. So there's one phenomenon that I didn't include in the, in, into the presentation, uh, which is the Bonferroni correction. So a big mistake that people don't take into consideration is, as we've mentioned, the more experiences you are going to add to the test, the more likely it is to get false positives. There is a way to take this into account, and it's by applying the Bonferroni correction, or there is another correction that is available. I, pref I prefer this one because, to be honest, it's easier to implement, and it's fine for my business, but you can do your research and change it. Um, so what happens here is, I'll show you how it works. If you open the calculator, you're going to have some cells that you can change. The first one is the experiences. So here, you're going to put the number of variations. You're going to see the number going up. So we start with two. One is control and one is variation. Let's say that we go with four variations. And the number of samples per experience is going up. Same with the um, baseline. So we, we are started with 50%. Let's say that you have a page that has 15%. As you can see, the number of samples goes way more. Like, you need a lot of samples. This is why, in my case, I'm quite lucky in my current business, but most of the situation, you're probably going to need high, high number of samples. And then the minimum detectable effect. Let's say that we are going to test just a copy change or a button, that by a color change in the button, we can, we can expect a 4% instead of a 10%. Boom, it goes up. So this is another proof that you need both the changes if you want to reduce the number of samples. And then the last two parameters, which are probably the most common ones, is the statistical significance. How much are you willing to trade off in terms of accuracy of sample cell calculation? So if you want more significance, 99%, it goes up again. But if you say, you know what, I'm happy with 80%, which is not suggested by statisticians, it goes down. And the power, which is, again, usually set to 80%, if you want more, the sample goes up again. So these are the variables, the ingredients in your sample set calculation. There's no right way to do it. The way we handle it is based on the product, based on the page. So you definitely need to think how much risk you want to get. So if you're willing to take on more risk, go down with these parameters and run the test. If you are <clears throat> testing something on the checkout page for a big client or for a company that actually is an e-commerce, I would definitely go with a bit stricter parameters. Just avoid that you push the test live and then the business says, oh, you told me that that was a winner, but actually we're losing money. Not good. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm more than welcome to um, get any questions from you. Feel free to go about this one. And thank you very much for listening, guys. Yes? So you mean this one? SSBF. Yeah, this is for the Bonferroni correction. <clears throat> this is where the Bonferroni correction is applied. So you, you change the statistical significance, the power, yep. and then the Bonferroni correction takes into consideration the experiences and it changes the, the, the significance. So it's calculated automatically, basically. Yes. So just to give you an example, this one actually is a very good question. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, we are running a test with, actually it doesn't make sense with these numbers. Let's just change it. Say 90 and 70, right? Now it's just the character, yeah. yeah. So basically, what happens here is that, depending on the number of experiences, the statistical significance that is actually used to make the calculation is 98% instead of 90. Why? Because given that you have four experiences, this is basically telling you, if you want to be accurate and you want to reduce the chances of getting false positives, you need to increase 
the statistical significance. This is basically a correction. This is why it's called by the Sintepofri correction. This correction is because it basically changes the value of the statistical significance to make sure they be taken into account that. If I lower down the experiences from 4 to 2, it's going to get to 90. Because it's exactly, um, it doesn't need to take into consideration any correction, because this is the standard case. And this is something that online calculators don't do. And it's not like it's the end of the world, but if you want to be accurate, or if you want to know it, it's always good to apply these kind of corrections. Thank you. Is there any other question? Even about A-B testing in general? Oh, yeah? Uh, I have more of a like, generic question. Yes. Uh, what do you think about uh, testing uh, for micro-conversions instead of the end goal? Uh, yes. Does it really apply? Does it work? It's a, very, it's a very good question. So, my point of view is that like, there's a lot of different tests that you can run, right? So, if you work for an agency, you're optimizing, say, a landing page, more, most likely you're going to have a look at the checkout process. So, you're going to look at the revenue that everyone generates and this kind of stuff. But there are a lot of tests that you can run based on, for instance, UX changes. So I've done this kind of test in my previous company a lot. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to check how many people are actually spending money, but you can check how many people are actually interacting with the functionality. Let's say this is actually a very good example, filters. So I know for sure that Adidas tested recently on their website a new filter. So they have basically, on the left hand, uh, le left hand side, the filter was vertical and they move it into horizontal. Now, if you have to analyze this test, what would you use as a primary metric? If you use number of uh, orders or average value per order, to me, it doesn't give you a proper estimate of the test. Because at the end of the day, you are changing the filter. And the main goal is to make people you interact more with the filters and tailor down the, um, the number of items that they have to bag. So as a primary, primary metric, I would probably use number of items added to bag or interaction with filters. So you can definitely add goals that are not strictly related to the last step of your funnel and still get <coughs> learnings. And that gets to, that, this one gets to another point, which is something that we are changing with my company, which is not thinking A-B testing as a way to get more money, but as a, get, uh, as a way to learn. And this is why the team now is called the experimentation team and not commercial rate optimization because it's, it's about learning about your product and then you're recycling those learnings into different parts of the business. Okay. Thank you. There was someone else? Yes? I have a question about the minimal effects. Like, mm -hmm. um, especially if you grow your experimentation team, how do you share the knowledge basically of making sure that people come at a good estimate of a, a minimal detectable effect. Like yes. You might know it from your own experience over time, but how to explain to a junior that this will be probably 5% or this will be 50%. Yes. Like, it's true, and it's actually quite hard to yeah. estimate <coughs> in general, especially if you don't have a big uh, set of data points about your past experience in testing in the company. So. One thing that is quite important is we, we actually analyze tests with R and we have implemented in R um, a, a sample set calculation that is based on the data whilst the test is running. So even though if you estimate in the beginning you might be wrong or completely wrong in case you are junior, you just joined the company, you don't know exactly what's the conversion rate, what's the uplift you can expect. This script is definitely going to help you because as soon as you launch the test, two or three days, you're going to have very good estimate based on what you already have. So this is one way that we use to mitigate it. The second one is use tests that you've run in, in the past as a baseline. So thank you very much. So if you run a test that is actually a copy change, very small change in terms of impact probably, unless it's like a landing page, um, then what you're going to find out is that you don't go over, say, 10% in my company. So we know that if you apply a minimum detectable effect, more than 10% is probably wrong. So you have to mitigate a bit. But I understand your point and you're right. Like, there, are, there, are, there are estimates and it's hard to get it right. Yeah, especially, especially in my case, how it is, it's like we really have an issue. Like we haven't done any experimentation so far on our website. Once to start. 
Yes. Then, like, you also don't have any baseline to to. Then it's a bit of a trial and error, yeah. even because like you can run the same text on multiple sites. This is our case. Like we own a portfolio of websites, right? So we test it on one page on one site, and we do the same on another property, and the result is different. So even though there is sort of correlation between the tests, because obviously it's similar, but you can't properly estimate and be super accurate, even though it's the same change. So get a decent baseline in the beginning, probably after 30, 40 tests, you're going to have a good understanding of it. So yeah. Also, you at the end of the day, it's called minimum detectable effect, so I don't know who asked the question. <laughs> so you would have to think, like, what's the minimum you're willing to accept? And if you also take into consideration that sometimes in statistics there's noise, so you might think your conversion rate is like 15 percent. Maybe there's a an interval, so it like fluctuates from 13 to 17 percent. So you know, okay, I'm not willing to accept less than three percent. So then you might just keep go with four percent. And like if this test has at least a four percent uplift, then we'll uh, we'll uh, take that. And uh, from and if it has less than that, then you can be like, okay. It's been two weeks. We've had enough of a sample size, but this this is only getting us a three percent or two percent uplift. So you might test something that has a bigger uplift. Yeah, I got actually a very good tip for you <coughs> because it's the best moment to do it. So if you run an AEA test, so you push like a dummy campaign live, right? And you start collecting the data. Try to understand what's the noise in your platform and set the minimum detectable effect as that noise. So you're willing to detect anything above that. That would be a good starting point. But always take that into consideration. So you're going to get the best and better estimate and you're going to avoid pushing stuff like that actually was not a winner. Any more? No? Thank you very much.